Well, welcome everyone to part one of the digital journey, new opportunities and challenges for the auditor. And this is the second of three live sessions we have for you here at Exemplar Global's Food Safety Expo. I'm your host for today's session, Mike Richmond. Exemplar Global is excited to take our virtual uh, events to the next level with these live sessions, which delve into relevant topical areas and allow you, the viewer, to ask questions and interact directly with our subject matter experts in real time. And for this session, we're being joined by three extremely knowledgeable and well-spoken panelists, Graham Monroe, Philip Cryer, and Keith Phillips. But before I introduce you to Graham, Philip, and Keith, let's quickly set the ground rules. We encourage your questions anytime during the session. To post a question for the panel, just type them into the chat box and then they'll get right over to me. Also note that this session is being recorded and will be made available to anyone who's a registrant of the Food Safety Expo On Demand. So if you're watching the recorded version, uh, you can ask questions of the panelists. Just email them to my colleague, Jane Bowler, at jbowler at exemplarglobal.org. And we'll then forward your questions, of course, on to Graham, Philip, and or Keith, and we'll get back to you from there. So without further ado, let's get to our panelists. Graham Monroe is head of the auditor team of the Avaco Grower Group, responsible for more than 60% of New Zealand's avocado exports. Now in his third year of the digital journey, Graham is able to audit the 800 farms in the cooperative across the multiple schemes required by his customers and do it with a small, well-trained team. A former executive at Telco, Phil Cryer is the CEO of CB Telor, who do more than half of the ISO certifications in New Zealand, including more than 60% of the health and safety audits. He started his digital journey four years ago. Keith Phillips is a CEO of assessment platform provider, Quantum Leap Beyond Spreadsheets, QLBS. Their platform, Quantum Leap, has been used for audit and assessment of compliance, quality, and business excellence across the world. All three of these men can be considered digital travelers. Um, and what is a digital traveler? Well, they're really digital travelers in the sense that they have a sense of uh, an attitude of discovery and utilizing the cutting edge tools of IT systems and technology in the service of food safety auditing. Uh, in part one of this presentation, and again, we're going to have part two tomorrow, um, so look out for that. Uh, we're going to look at the journey that our panelists have undertaken so far over their past several years in this space. And now I'd like to turn it over to our speakers. So um, they're going to set the tone for you a little bit on what their digital journeys have been like. So to start with, I'm going to ask Graham Monroe to jump in and tell you about his experience. Graham, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Um, we have got, uh, Avaco have got uh, 800 growers um, spread about 700 kilometers apart throughout uh, the North Island and New Zealand. Um, we have a number of growers that are under two hectares, so there's a variable size. 59% are under two hectares, 10% above five hectares, and about 3% above 10 hectares. So there's a variable size. We have six packing facilities who actually provide the inspectors um, for our program. We've obviously had to go out and train all these inspectors as well as educating growers. And so it's been a fascinating experience where 80% of our growers would be above 50 years in age. And so there's a little reluctance or was a reluctance to accept a new technology um, and move away from pen and paper. Um, so the education was a very, very uh, strong part of our program. The other aspect of it is, is um, we faced when implementing the program, and um, it still does occur now and then, is the integrity of the internet and uh, access to uh, Wi-Fi and internet in rural areas and um, particularly the, right up the top of the North Island, um, it's, it does have some impact. So we have an online, offline um, system where um, it auto the uh, information automatically uploads um, once we're back into range of the internet. So it's, it's actually been uh, worked particularly well. 
we've had to go out and provide a number of um, uh, a great deal of information, guidance material to our suppliers. And that's been great because it's assisted us in a number of areas. And I guess that moves on to the second point, which um, I want to talk briefly about is the major benefits of what we found. Um, probably given that we've got uh, 800 avocado farms and we've got um, 20, roughly um, 25 or inspectors, consistency was a, um, a major uh, issue or uh, aspect that we had to encounter up front. So um, auditor training um, was uh, implemented and it's been great because we've used the online audit program for training and also the, the way we have structured our program. The audit reporting enables instant review of reports. So within uh, an hour of an audit being conducted, we can have uh, internal auditors reviewing audits to look at consistency in aspects of the audit. It's provide also, uh, you can argue which is the greatest benefit. We've actually taken the opportunity to add in additional questions to cover various standards. So the basis of our program is Global Gap, but we've actually added in a number of other questions um, that relate to various other standards like um, environmental management, um, modern slavery, and uh, having the um, digital program makes it so easy. And our inspectors can ask a range of uh, questions and um, the uh, growers um, don't really notice that there's other aspects being covered. Uh, benefit, another benefit, reduced costs because um, audit times are way down on what traditionally are. We have the opportunity to do a lot of the audits, assessments, base material online at the office before the inspectors go out to the farm. So we have um, reduced costs, improved com compliance, the growers really accept what we're doing. Uh, we provided them all with compliance materials, supplier manuals, and that's made a huge difference to um, uh, the compliance throughout all the growers across the group. Uh, the speed of change, um, it's, a, it's been great. We is a benefit that we can identify an issue and almost um, within 24 hours, we can have them um, resolved. The third point is using auditing as a management tool. Uh, that has actually become more and more to the forefront where management, the management team within the company are now asking questions that they never asked uh, at the beginning of the program. They're asking questions about um, uh, just basic growing issues, which they'd never thought about. But now with a new food safety culture, modern slavery, environmental management that's going throughout the world, the questions that they're asking, um, we can provide the uh, information for them. Um, and that's because we can add on questions with a digital program like we've got, we can and include questions that meet management criteria. Um, you know, for, for an, it's actually, what it's actually doing is also creating industry leadership for us um, and probably sector leadership too. And the fact that we can, we're preempting some of the demands from our retailers throughout the world. We can, some of the questions now where we are producing reports on um, water use and where's it come from? How are they using it? Staff use, how many staff are they employing? Uh, do they have accommodation? Um, agrochemical use, 
fertilizer use and we can compare between growing regions uh, throughout New Zealand. The other probably one of, just in finishing off to one of the other benefits is uh, we're getting real time assessment and analysis of the audit information. So we can analyze uh, almost immediately by inspector and in growing area, um, the corrective actions that we're finding and the types of corrective actions. Um, we can assess audit times um, who's taking longer, who's, who's taking shorter, who's got problems. And we can do that, as I said, by region or by inspector. So, and we're using that information to drive our training programs and working with the uh, growers uh, in particular areas. So um, probably it has probably the biggest benefit overall that we are now finding it's becoming a management tool. It's, it's not compliance auditing. Uh, it's becoming an integral, integral part of our management system within the company. So over to you, Mike. Great. Well, Graham, thank you. Thank you for that oversight. That was, that was excellent. Uh, so Philip, how about you? What would you, what would you say your experience has been like? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say to Graham, uh, that was very enlightening. Thank you. I enjoyed that, and uh, I can see some distinct overlaps with what I'm about to talk about. Uh, just a bit of background first, I guess. Um, Telarc, uh, we're a government-owned entity in New Zealand. Um, the bulk of our business has been a management system auditing, so 9,001, 14,001, 45,001. Uh, we purchased a, um, a certification body seven years ago who were um, involved in the food safety area, and when I arrived in the role that I'm currently in, the board gave me um, one challenge, which was to grow our food safety business. Um, and now look, New Zealand is a very, 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 very small country in the middle of nowhere. And you know, we, we don't have large scale in our industries. So the big, the big thing for Telarc was to try and find a way where we could develop a point of difference. Um, just having auditors and being able to apply those auditors against various standards wasn't going to be enough. You know, we, we, we compete with international certification bodies. So we have Eurofins here, we have SGS, SAR Global, to name a few, Assure Quality, who's a domestic player as well. So we had to try and find a point of difference. And look, when I first went out on audits, it became pretty clear to me that the way in which we captured information um, was pretty close to Stone Age, to put it bluntly. Um, books, pens, uh, and, and the reality was that we were getting really meaningful information from our clients. They were asking us to come into their sites to be able to observe and look for evidence of activity within that business against a standard. That's a pretty unique position to be in, to actually be asked in. And so, you know, we're asking consistent questions. So the thought obviously went through my head is how can we start to get this information into some form of technology? And that began my journey with QLBS. And look, if I look at the auditors, they do a great job. Don't get me wrong here, but you know, the focus was on the report and doing a good report. So what we did is we set out on our journey and we used the local regulated food safety regime. Um, we have an entity here, government agency, Ministry of Primary Industries, which the bulk of our horticultural and agricultural um, industries have to deal with. Um, we represent the regulator by going into various outlets throughout New Zealand to conduct their verifications. So we decided we would try and put that particular framework into an audit tool. And we had a lot of learnings, I can promise you. Um, we were leading edge, and at times it felt like we were bleeding edge, to put it mildly, as we tried to discover ways to make this work. The two biggest difficulties, um, again, you know, there were a number, but the two biggest I'll go through was really the food orders, um, and just trying to get them to move away from pen and paper towards 
the potential to capture the information. Now, they were keen, don't get me wrong, they could see the benefits, but what you had was you had individuals who'd worked in the industry from anywhere from 15 to 20 years to two years. They were varying ages from mid to late 20s to early 60s. And trying to get them to do things in a consistent manner, because when you're dealing with ones and zeros with technology, you have to be relatively consistent. And that was a bit of an issue for us, and particularly when we found problems, because we did start off this journey by actually using a more agile approach. And what we discovered was the areas that were causing, you know, would, would cause issues with development of reports and generation of reports on the fly. And that reduced confidence. So what we realized very quickly is that if you are going to go down the path of taking on an audit tool of any sort, you have to do it in quite an orchestrated way. And one thing that always pops into my head is strong user acceptance test. You need to get a number of auditors to ensure that the tool is actually fit for purpose. We didn't start our journey that way. We started our journey by actually trying to get the auditors to find the problems as they went through the audits. And that causes a lot of issues. The second most important thing that we identified was ensuring that the tool was actually able to, in some way, shape or form, replicate the auditor's journey. If you think about an auditor when they're on site, they are observing a multitude of things in one visionary glance. And that particular glance can see multiple areas where there are potential opportunities for improvement. There could be some non-conformances, there could be some non-compliances. And they can apply to any one of the areas within the structured food safety program that you may be auditing. So to think that you can actually go through a food audit in a sequential manner proved to be extremely difficult. So to get the confidence of the auditors is very, very important in all of this. The actual standard itself and dropping that into the framework is relatively easy. But getting the confidence and ensuring that the way in which you navigate through the tool, and look, we've spent four years now developing to a point where our navigation of the tool is up there in terms of its efficiency. Nothing's ever perfect, but we certainly have it up there. In terms of the overall reliability of the tool, we've certainly found ourselves a lot more confident with it. Some of the key learnings. Um, look, you know, it's, and look, Graham touched on this. In New Zealand, it's about reliability. I mean, we have areas that we have to go into as well as auditors. And the remote nature of those means that you are dealing with online, offline. And you look at the way in which the major players actually develop some of the core applications that we use within the tool, they develop it as an offline option only or an online option only. So it makes it rather difficult to try and actually audit when you're in those remote areas utilizing the tool. So we've had to learn to do that. I've talked about agile. You know, that's a really important thing to understand that it's better to try and go with stronger user acceptance testing and ensuring the tool is actually 98% right before you take it out there. And look, auditors, I've mentioned this before, I mean, when you're upgrading a tool, and this happens on a regular basis, auditors have a habit of actually storing things in their own personal drives. And of course, what they then do is they pull those out and drop them over the top of the enhanced version, and the next minute things don't work. And this is just an example of some of the things we've discovered as we've gone through this. We've, we've had a number of issues that have been perceived to be driven by the technology when the reality is they're actually driven by the fact that we potentially haven't released things in a way where we've cleaned out all of the historical information and actually upgraded it to all of the new information that we needed to have. And look, I think one of the key things coming through all of this is and this is what we always aimed for, was to get some form of meaningful data across a broad cross-section of activities. Now, we, we couldn't quantify that at the start. So what we did was we obviously used the template that we were given from the New Zealand Food Safety Regulator, and they provided that for both wine and food, which were active in both. And on the next slide, you'll see some of the results that we got in the wine area. So what you can see is these are specific to areas that we audit. 
And this is across the entire wine industry in New Zealand for about the 60% of the companies that we actually audit. And you can see over the last three years, we've started to collate some data. And what it starts to highlight for industry and for individual wineries is the areas where we are seeing the major non-compliances or non-conformances. And if you look at the food area as well, what it starts to do is create a solid foundation of data, which can then drive capital expenditure or focused initiatives. So historically, there was none of the data being, none of the data was available. So that actually drove conversations potentially around personal agendas. What this does is start to drive conversations around improvement activity, where you are going to get the biggest bang for your dollar. And this is one of the key things that we're finding as we go through this is that it's, it's, it's not a surprise you know, for anyone, but what it surprises is when you consolidate it. And that means it's similar to what Graham says, it becomes a management tool. And what we are doing is we're building up more and more data across industry, which we can then use when we're talking to regulatory bodies, industry bodies, or individual companies. And for me, this is actually where the power of what we're trying to do is. And when you start to get into the management system space, it's the same conversation. If you look at ISO, they use the Annex SL structure. They use that, you know, 17021, that's an FSSC, which I'm sure a number of the people on the call are very aware of. Now, that's another area where you start to capture data against core topics. And then you can start to identify where the biggest value driver areas are for improvement activity. So that's our experience to date. Look, you know, we've come a long way. We've still got a ways to go, but this is, we believe will be our point of difference when we are talking with regulators, industry bodies, when we're talking with offshore participants who are wanting to differentiate the way in which they support their suppliers in the market. By being able to provide this data, we can actually give them a way of actually channeling focused resources around improvement. And at the end of the day, particularly in New Zealand, that's what we want to do. We want to be really good at providing food and wine in these two cases to the world. Thank you. Back to you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Wow, I, I loved how you amplified and reflected some of what Graham's learnings were as well. So that was that was wonderful. So Keith, why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about uh, what you've learned in your experiences through this digital journey? Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. The, those um, two travelers, digital travelers, uh, have actually been working at this for, for, for some time. And, um, there's enormous richness of experience in, in, in those two. To a large extent, we owe them at QLBS um, an enormous amount. They have stuck their neck out, experimented, uh, been inquisitive, um, made mistakes with us, and um, we, we definitely are, um, are indebted to them. Now, <clears throat> I've been actually doing digital transformation uh, um, stuff for quite some time now. I actually launched the first... Um, uh, the Macintosh 128K floppy disk drive uh, um, Apple computers in the UK. I was working for Apple then. And we've gone through a number of digital transformation. And what, what's been reflected here is, is, the, um, is often the biggest you know, uh, problem, that the biggest problem is a human one, not a technology one. The technology seems to be in advance of humans, uh, the, the human ability to actually embrace it, learn how to use it, and perhaps even change the way that they, uh, they have been doing things like audit. Um, and that's an extremely painful thing to do. And there's got to be a return on investment, but they can't see the return on investment. All they can do is see the pain. So I think it is really important for the lessons that have come out of this in, in, terms of, um, in terms of making sure that the appropriate testing, training, and confidence is installed in the team that's, um, that's going to take the digital journey. <clears throat> so I'd like to share um, a, a couple of uh, case studies, just while I've got uh, here, that really talk about um, some transformational practices. Um, it, it's all about assessment harvesting. We've now got the tools, and I've, there's a one uh, picture that we've got here of, um, of a smartphone. We've got digital cameras everywhere. We've got three digital cameras on the average smartphone now. 
Um, we can pick up video. We can take pictures of uh, documentation. We can uh, um, we can get farmers sitting out in fields to um, to go out there and show us what they what they're doing. Um, we can do online, offline. In other words, um, uh, as uh, as Avoca uh, pointed out, as Graham pointed out, you can actually work in the field, and when you do go online, the data gets automatically. Um, automatically transferred. So the ability to harvest uh, assessments, uh, to be able to harvest um, evidence, uh, to make judgment calls, and then to capture that in databases is, um, is part of the, the, the digital advantage, essentially, when everything is interconnected, uh, when you're using cloud-based, as they call platforms, uh, where there's one version of the truth and everybody that does have the authority can have access to that version of the truth, enables you to actually have multiple people working on the assessment uh, from beginning to end, from farmer to uh, even the supermarket chain. Uh, the other side we talked about as well is data irrig irrigation, which uh, is really capturing the data and, and watering it so you can actually turn it into, into knowledge. And it's as those knowledge yields, I think, that's going to transform, transform this um, this industry to a greater extent. Auditors will turn from a compliance checklist tickers uh, to uh, knowledge providers. And that doesn't mean you disrupt the integrity of the independent audit. Uh, it means that you'll package knowledge in a way that it can be used by the stakeholders, uh, the management, uh, as mentioned before, the regulators, etc. I'd like to move on to um, the one case study, if we could uh, get there, the, the next case study, a different industry, although, of course, a lot of restaurants and catering uh, bodies are right in this industry, but it's Australian tourism. And I uh, specifically picked this case study because they've really uh, dug deep in, into the um, in, in, into digital technologies to, to do something that they've been doing for now some five years. Um, of course, the tyranny of distance across the whole of Aust uh, Australia. Cost is always a problem. Uh, but in their particular case, their objective was to try and build capacity and ensure compliance. Uh, so they have a number of accreditation systems and capacity building systems, which I'll talk you through, uh, that, that are rewarded by either the, the badge of quality or the participation in the marketing programs, getting the leads, et cetera if one goes through this, this journey of, um, uh, of quality and compliance improvement. Uh, and without going into any of the depth, because that's not the case in point, it's the journey starts off with a self-assessment. So any hospitality or accommodation or, um, or tourism um, company anywhere uh, starts off by uh, registering interest, if you like, for the award, uh, but then doing a self-assessment. And we know the um, uh, the, the, the issues with self-assessment, but self-assessment, which includes evidence uploading. Very easy for them to, hey, I have a swimming pool, take a picture of the swimming pool with their digital camera. And they, so self-assessment, phase one, review by online auditors. Auditors who are expert at reviewing um, uh, whatever um, a, a certification program or, um, or scheme uh, that has been put in place. And these can be experts that are not in the same geography. So again, you can start to optimize um, expertise no matter where it is. So a scuba diver expert in the Great Barrier Reef can be advising or, or um, uh, auditing um, a scuba diving operation in, in, in Perth. Uh, so there's a period then of interaction, online interaction. Hey, send me more data. I want a picture of this. Where is this? file that proves that you've got whatever license that you've actually got. So that's the one sense. And then when there's a process of review by other bodies, um, they actually then send the human resource out, the human capital that is available to actually target the, uh, the organizations that are seen as the highest risk, perhaps where uh, they are concerned about the integrity of the audit. Um, but they can then optimize the use of the human capital that is available, sending them out to make the audits and verify uh, the certification. 
that's wonderful. And having got to a level of um, confidence in the audit, then of course, the automation of reports and uh, certification. The next phase um, is the awards. In this particular case, they have an award program for rewarding excellence, which moves it beyond. The judges would sit on top of a body of evidence, their body of knowledge. So it wouldn't be starting from zero. They'd have their own criteria uh, and they would then uh, perhaps do on-site audits for the, uh, for the, winning, um, the winning award um, uh, companies. Uh, this of course is all augmented by other data that's coming in. The data coming in in this particular case, so we're going into a, a phase where we're not just doing audits, we're actually reading data that might be coming from other sources to actually uh, test the credibility of the audit itself. Uh, in this particular case, taking customer satisfaction see, uh, uh, feeds from a Lonely Planet or um, uh, other uh, such in Expedia, uh, that, um, that actually do that so that you can start to profile customer satisfaction scores and get some early indication as to where the, pro uh, the problems are or perhaps uh, uh, reviewing where the, um, uh, where the issues are or where the audit is in doubt, a cross check based on what's actually happening, what metrics and data is happening against the judgment calls of the audit process. And I think we'll see more and more of that happening in the uh, agricultural sector where we'll be picking data up from the internet of things from uh, farm IQ systems that are available there that are looking at the running of a farm. So we'll be able to see uh, what sort of uh, results are coming out in terms of yield, perhaps moisture content and fertilizer uh, residues, etc. And we'll be able to look at those at auditors, which will give us empirical evidence or some guidance as to, as to the um, legitimacy of self-assessments or self-audits in one case, or uh, the, the legitimacy of our own call. So it's an it's a interconnected knowledge system that will start to occur, which will mean that the auditor themselves will again move from being um, an auditor to to also being a knowledge worker. Um, so that's a, that's a wonderful case study in this case, because the network was in place when COVID came in and they needed to have a COVID clean assessment system, they were very quickly able to, uh, to push that COVID clean um, um, certification program across the whole of the Australian uh, marketplace. They were always, they were already networked, already wired up uh, as, they, as they move forward. So that's a very, very interesting case study. So forgive me for dwelling on something outside of the system, but I think we can learn uh, from wherever we can, we can get the, um, the learnings. I'd just like to touch on one other um, case study before we get into the, the question sets. And, and this case study will actually be dealt with in greater depth. Uh, the gentleman Marco Roffia, uh, a wonderful Italian uh, digital traveler, um, who is uh, not only the uh, audit leader of CCPB, one of the lead, um, the lead certification bodies in Italy, uh, but he's also the chairperson of the Global Gap uh, CB committee. That's the worldwide committee of CBs that report back to Global Gap himself. But he actually put in a program. They had no alternative to, uh, to do anything other than remote audit in a situation where the farmer was in the Lebanon. In fact, the producer group was in the Lebanon, uh, struggling not only from wars, but from pandemics. Uh, the closest, nearest uh, auditor um, was Ebram from Egypt, uh, and they conducted a remote audit where the farmer themselves provided the on-site arms and legs, taking around the place a smart digital camera, uh, which the, uh, the auditor and the reviewer, that was um, Marco, uh, could actually see what he was doing. They could drive the farmer around, they could actually ask questions, seek evidence, and then uh, conduct an audit. And it was seen a great success and um, uh, satisfactory to, um, uh, to meet um, criteria. A lot of obviously issues associated with, with the legitimacy of that based on today's 
standards of, of audit, uh, but to their case in point, it was all that they could do to ensure that there was a chance of getting some of the produce of farmers into the export marketplace. So I'll leave the case studies there. Marco will be coming in in tomorrow's uh, panel discussion, uh, which uh, Michael will talk about at some stage. So over to you, Michael, for the questions. Ah, oh, we have one other. Yes, this is something I'd like to talk about in the question set uh, when we get into it. Um, and, and it's this, the multi-certification problem. The, 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 one of the real challenges of, uh, of the audit in this area is the increasing number of audits that are changing continuously as um, uh, other versions coming across. This is just a little, little diagram of, um, of your uh, international audits, your, uh, your brand owner uh, requirements, the um, auditing required by local governments, the auditing uh, required by um, uh, national governments uh, makes it an extremely complex task to uh, manage the question sets uh, to not be continuously knocking on doors to do yet another audit at the farm level, which increases cost and complexity. And this is an area where I think technology can make a major, um, a major impact. Uh, we've seen what Avoco are doing, which is um, integrating some of those audits so that you ask a question once, seek evidence once, and that data flows automatically into the appropriate question set. So a lot of the work that we're doing with both Avoco and with, uh, with, the, with Telarc and other organizations is how to solve this particular problem, reduce the burden whilst automating the uh, reports and providing the stakeholders with the knowledge that they need. So it'd be interesting to get questions on that and a discussion on this model. Michael. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and there's Keith's information. If you'd like to email Keith directly to express your views, that would be wonderful. Uh, yes, great, great presentations, guys. Really good depth of information. I think we're, we're really treated with your experiences uh, on your digital, ver digital journeys as digital travelers. Um, and I want to remind you all, we're, we have a number of questions in already, but I want to remind you that you can get your questions in. Just uh, type them into the chat box, and they'll be sent right over to me. So uh, I am going to jump right into the questions because we do have uh, have a few here. Um, so let me let me start with uh, with this one. Um, hmm, okay. okay. So um, to all the speakers, what is the best approach in handling conflict resolution when auditing remotely, when the quality of the objective evidence is in the auditor's perspective and is not clearly transmitted? Be the internet technology used? Well, that's an interesting question. Graham, maybe maybe you want to jump on that one. I see you have a little smile on your face. Maybe you'd like to respond to that. Uh, it's a, thank goodness. We actually haven't um, done any fully remote audits, um, say, within our Avoca Grow Group, but I have done uh, some with... Um, our Australian handlers. So what, what, what happens, our avocados are shipped through uh, containers to Australia and, um, hand, and we've contracted um, handlers over in Australia to um, manage the product. So I have undertaken, or I'll step back a bit. Traditionally, I've um, traveled to Australia and I've assessed our, the systems of our contracted handlers. Um, given due to COVID, traveling hasn't occurred. So I've had to undertake some remote audits. Um, they're pretty good, but it's still reliant. You know, I like, you, you like to wander around the corners and poke in uh, dark alleys looking for um, things that might be hidden. So the systems worked all right, but it's, it still leaves that, you know, you have to have people with um, mobile phones or with, with um, um, computers, which they, tablets, they can wander around and take photos for you. But it, it's, um, 
I'm still not 100% sold on pure, pure remote audits. Yeah, I think if I could, if I could leap in there, um, there there's, there's no question that the most, the most sophisticated um, uh, data foraging um, device we know is our own human brain. We, we kind of got <laughs> our, our nostrils and eyes and ears and, and, and touch and feel, you know, all wired into the brain itself and we can sense what's actually happening out there. So I don't think there's anything that will, that'll replace that for, for some time. Um, but, the, but there is, I think what's gonna happen is that the ability, and we're seeing some of our clients already, already doing this, the ability to ask some of the questions, which may be the, you know, I need information on this, or I need this evidence. So, so, so a remote or a pre-assessment process uh, where you can organize, ask, answer a bunch of questions, organize the the evidence before you before you get there, and that'll save you know time and money and give perhaps a more informed um, intelligence going in. You know that's the that's the one side. Of it. The other side, of course, is is the ability to get more data feeds. You know that, that can actually give you some evidential stuff like like um, yeah. the data feeds from the Internet of Things or, or whatever other you know benchmarks are important to to prove that. Um, or, or, or to to give some indication as to where the where the, where the problem is, but uh, I think with some yeah, Phil, you you you, I'm I'm sure would have a view on 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 this. Um, what's your thinking? I've got a view, all right. Um, look, I, I, I suppose I could talk about our experience, but let's take a leap. I mean, we, we we've actually um, been evaluating, and we will trial at some point what's called head-mounted tablet, um, and, and what. That is, is it's actually a all-in-one um, microphone, camera, and tablet sitting on one device that actually sits on your head. Yeah, and yeah, you know, we're looking at that just to do our auditor evaluations trial within that area. We we don't want to go and force that onto a customer. I mean, all of these problems, mobile phone, you know, make sure you've got strong internet, all these good things. Yes, they're a problem, but yeah, you know, give it another three or four years, or two or three years. The technology advances that we're seeing today will be commonplace in two years' time. And there are some good head-mounted tablet examples all over the world, which I believe will interface quite nicely back into the audit tool that we've been using for with QLBS. So I can't, I won't talk about the experience we've had. And yes, we've had a load of them, and it's exhausting trying to conduct remote audits, trying to gather data, trying to get the client to slide underneath the bacon slicer to have a look and see if there's anything underneath and all those good things. But the reality is that, you know, there's, there are some new technologies coming along, which I think are going to be just fantastic for this industry in terms of being able to actually get the individual to use what is an advanced set of eyes and ears to go and look for you. And you will be able to direct them. And some of this, of course, is, is related to cost. You know, the, if you take big, big geographies like, like Australia, uh, for instance, the, the cost of flying to somewhere and then having to spend, spend the night you know, there because of the, the number of travel hours, perhaps that, that, that resource can be converted into, in, in, into um, other things on an optimization basis. You know? So you actually do the on-site audit where it really matters at a time in which it matters. So I'm sure that, you know, there's going to be a reshaping of the way people do it because of the different value systems that, um, that the technology enable you to, um, uh, to deal with. And, and don't forget the carbon footprint as well that you're actually going to be achieving by actually not having to travel as much as you may have as well. Yeah. Okay. So Any other questions, another, Mike? Here's another good question. Yeah, we have, we have several good questions. Uh, Here's one that's interesting. What is your advice for helping auditors get on board with new audit technology? That's that's always an issue. Is how do you encourage people to overcome maybe some of their reluctance with with the technology? Um, what what do you think about that, Graham? Yeah, um, that that was the one that we were particularly concerned with, and um, our approach was talking to the management team was, okay, we're going to have to invest in um, our staff. So we, we had them travel to a central venue and there's costs, traveling costs and um, um, a, um, obviously a venue cost. But, and, and we, a lot of 
we trained them, but um, a lot of the, the um, session was based on providing background to what was happening, why we were doing it, when we were going to be doing it, how we were going to be doing it, and, um, to, to, and, and how they participated in the whole auditing program and the value that they would be providing to grow to growers and themselves. And it was fortunate that some of them um, have come from a growing background so that they could understand it. And so um, then we followed up with having the technical part of the training session. And, and that's where QLBS and a couple of the team came down. And we worked through the program. We took away some of their concerns and the threats that they might have had. And we um, really trained them and brought them alongside. We sent them away and said, okay, go back home, think about what you've heard and um, have, a, have a, a trial at home with the computers and, uh, and um, the program. And then we traveled to each area, region, and we undertook training with uh, each area's inspectors, group inspectors, and sort of kept followed up from what we were doing and asked questions and appeased, you know, went through the appeasement process um, to, to me, uh, mediate or to um, change some of their concerns. The next part of the training was then we, the auditors or the inspectors went out on an audit together so that they could build on each other's and um, that, that worked very well. And eventually, um, you know, it, it just the whole program started to run together. The inspectors grew uh, confidence they became very valuable and um, the growers actually start to talk to them about how they could improve their processes and their systems. And then um, most recently over the past 12 months, the inspectors have actually been driving the change to our program. They've actually been saying, can you do this? Can we do that? We think you could do this better. You know, so it's now the chicken and the egg type thing is, uh, and it's brilliant. You know? And um uh, it's actually, I think, uh, Mike. It's it's you have to invest in your staff, yeah, you know, and and show that they are important and that they are a very essential element of the whole program, and that's how we got to where we are now. I agree, I agree with Graham. It's you've you've got to you've got to get all of the team engaged in the process. So that's from requirements gathering through to user acceptance testing. Our, our most recent drop, we put it into the sand pit and all of the auditors had a chance to go and play with it. They gave feedback, they identified issues. And you've got, you've got to take each of the issues quite seriously. You can't just say, well, here's the technology, use it. Because you know, we, we actually found that this most recent drop that we put in, we actually engaged a user experience expert. So they actually shadowed and talked to the food auditors to understand how they operate it. So you're trying to give them something that mirrors the way they operate, but at the same time, it's got a high level of investment from them personally and what's actually sitting in front of them. And that's the, that, that's the only way I can see this actually continue to evolve. And it's great to hear Graham's story about he's got it to a point now where his team are really actively engaging and participating, participating with feedback. We're getting into the same position. And that's, that's, a, that's a good place to be. One of the, one of the things we're doing is, um, is working with Exemplar Global on, on trying to accelerate experience, accelerating um, uh, <coughs> drive time. There's no, no substitute in my experience through the, is, is for, for getting in there and doing it. You can put PowerPoint slides up and talk to people, but they've got to do it, not necessarily live, but if you can provide a simulation environment, you know, just get their hands on, use the trial system, go out there and, and do it. And there's also, um, and, and I mean, the, the ultimate is, one of the problems you may say is that we're automating the past, whereas actually what we want to do is create the future. If, if you use the technology to automate the way, the way that they've been doing it, because you're concerned about um, acceptance, uh, you may actually be, be missing out on really taking that, um, you know, that, that, that leap forward. But taking that leap forward does require you know, people to see the returns that they're, they're actually going to get from the investment 
that they make in terms of you know understanding how to perhaps change the way they they're doing things and it does that investment is in you know drive time and positive reinforcement i guess it's a it's a difficult thing to do John, we we yeah. only have a few it's, minutes left that's so. also another thing yeah another thing i didn't mention is that um we're very clear that um it doesn't matter if you made mistakes you know is that we all make mistakes and and we learn from them and that's how we can improve so um they went away that there was no punishment you know D do things you know, go out and trial it and try it test it. and if you're not sure talk to us mm -hmm. and that that's great because you brought me right up to the what i wanted to ask you guys for a final comment about was was you know what what have been the big the key takeaways the key strategic learnings that in just a few words if you each could just give us you know what this experience what as digital travelers you've learned and, and where you see this going just give me give me a a minute a piece maybe uh, maybe we could start with you philip on on what you've learned Look, I, the digital travel <laughs> it's it's gained pace it's not stopping um i think i think you have to, to to think about a world where this is relatively seamless you know the the, the way in which the inter you interact between internal audit and external third-party audit starts to actually become quite symbiotic as opposed to them being distinct points of intervention. The way, and Keith talked about it, you know, he missed probably a hundred standards, food safety standards. The reality is that they're all asking the same question. There might be slight variations on a theme. Now, the reality is that you're wanting to get 95 to 98% of what's going on with that particular area right. And if you could get two sets of eyes from an internal and external point of view, actually evaluating against a common criteria, utilizing a tool which allows you to be able to capture data to drive improvement activity. That's gotta be a bigger positive outcome than just driving a really effective food safety management program. And it's probably not something that people wanna hear, but that's the reality of it. So I think uh, over time, I would look for consolidation, but. Also, I would like to think that the, tech, the tools and the technologies we're using are just going to evolve significantly. Great, Mike, what, what do you think about that? What would be your, your key strategic takeaway? Um, I think probably the biggest takeaway would be is, is that um, the world's changing very, very rapidly. Um, and we've got to be prepared for change. Inspectors, auditors, growers have to be prepared for change. And um, that's one of the things that I'm, when I'm out in the field, I'm talking to people about. I say, just say, look what's happening in space. Look what's happening in motor vehicles. Um, it's happening with what we're doing. And don't, don't fight it. Just see, okay, how, how can I be part of that? And that's what I encourage is working with the inspectors is saying, don't be afraid of telling us something that you think can be better. And just, and we will work with you where possible. Keith, last word to you. Yeah, so that's, that's a wonderful segue. I do, I do say something that, that, that a shift should be strategic. But what I mean by that is if you try and evolve, it's very hard work. Um, by strategic, it's even if we kind of figure out that we are becoming a knowledge working organization, we should figure out how much, how much investment, how much budget we're actually putting in to information technology tools and training of, of, of our people. If we're trying to, you know, scrabble it and, 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 uh, and do it without actually making the commitment and the investment, it becomes extremely hard. In fact, it becomes extremely costly because it'll bite, bite you back, you know, as, um, you know, people that have been doing things for 30 years, if you look at an organization, will actually go out of their way to find ways to, uh, to make sure that you fail in, in, in terms of doing, doing that because it's too risky or, um, or dangerous for them to participate. Uh, so it's got to be done strategically. You've got to think about your total business, uh, shifting your business into a, a, a knowledge working, uh, you know, business, uh, if it's not already. And, and look at it from top to bottom in terms of your own skills, budgets, and culture. And the last bit of the, the, the segue is, is attitude is the big one. 
you know, a, a attitude of, it's just as you put up there in that chart of um, exploring uh, digital opportunities, uh, be willing to take risk, a rewarding risk when, when it is taken um, and getting as much drive time, get behind the wheel and, you know, and, 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 and make it happen perhaps before you go out in, in, into the farm or even the same uh, process. Over well, to you, sir, to close. Gentlemen, that's, uh, I, I don't think I could have said it better myself. Uh, excellent, excellent job. Uh, again, this is Keith's information. If you uh, out there would like to contact Keith for more information, please do so. Uh, and that's our session. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to thank again Graham Monroe, Bill Cryer, and Keith Phelps for joining us and sharing their journeys, their digital journeys as digital travelers with us today. I um, want to remind you all to go ahead and, and please purchase your CPD for this session, if you would. Uh, and a quick reminder, we have uh, another live session uh, second part of this discussion, uh, this was kind of where we are now, and the next session is going to be where we're going, the road going forward. So please join us for that. It's actually in about 13 hours from now. So wherever you are in the world, join us, please, and uh, be here for the next session of the of this live session here on Food Safety Expo. So thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks again.